to Bob and to everybody in the swine group for asking me to give this lecture. I'm very honored and pleased, and I, I hope you all enjoy it. I appreciate your getting up early to, to join us here today. The topic I was charged to talk about was swine influenza viruses, um, kind of the ongoing challenge, um, and I'd like to highlight some future research activities. Um, Dr. Tim Lola said it best at the ASB meeting, uh, thanks for telling us all about the virus, Marie. Now tell us how to get rid of it. And so hopefully um, the new research activities will, will move us in that direction. Um, just to bring us everybody up to date on swine influenza virus, we dealt with in, in North America, really throughout the world, classic H1N1 swine influenza virus from about uh, 1918 um, all the way to uh, 1998, and it's still around today. Um, all eight gene segments of that virus uh, were, were swine influenza virus in origin, and, and you get that name for being the first virus ever isolated. Um, very stable virus, almost a very little drift for over 80 years. Um, then dramatically, um, in 1998, things started to change um, for swine, especially in uh, North America. An antigenic shift occurred where our, our pigs were infected with H3 influenza viruses, and prior to that, only infected with H1s. Now these H3 and 2 influenza viruses, they were both double and triple reassortment viruses, and that means that these viruses um, were found in pigs that had been infected with human, avian, and swine influenza viruses at the same time. Those viruses reassorted their genome and out came a reassortant, triple reassortant H3 and 2 influenza virus. And that particular group of viruses has gone, undergone accelerated drift and continuous reassortment to this day. Now, in addition to the new virus emerging in um, 1998, um, a dramatic change in our pig inventory occurred um, between the times of 1992 to 1997. Um, there was a move of pigs to the fringe corn belt, fringe corn belt um, and a great expansion in the industry. So not only did we have a great expansion in the industry in 1997, 1998, but also we had a new virus enter. Because people are always asking, uh, why all this change? Why is it because we started vaccinating at the same time? There's multiple things that occurred um, during this time frame. New virus introduction and a greater number of pigs to be exposed um, all together changed the swine influenza picture um, forever. And so since 1998, we've been um, dealing with multiple infections of uh, virus variants in our pigs. Um, 1999, we had H1N2 swine flu in the United States. I want to draw your attention um, to the center of these cartoon viruses that I've put up here. You can see they're a mixture of yellow, pink, and blue bars. And what I'm trying to designate there is that this is the triple reassortant virus genome inside of these viruses. And what they do is they just take on a different um, surface structure or surface glycoproteins every time. And so we have H1N2 viruses in 1999, a triple reassorted core on the inside, but H1 and N2 on the outside. H reassorted H1N1 viruses. Um, you may look at this and say, it's an H1N1, what's the difference? Well, in my cartoons, I make the difference blue and pink, um, but the inside of these viruses, these reassorted viruses now, are triple reassorted influenza viruses um, with genes from human swine and avian influenza viruses. And those inside genes create change in the hemagglutinin gene, the H1 on the outside. And so although it's an H1N1 still, it has a tremendous amount of antigenic and genetic variation from the classical H1N1s of the past. Um, our pigs are susceptible to receiving infections from avians and humans, and so in 2003 we discovered human-like H1N2 viruses in our pigs, um, 2004 H3N1 viruses in pigs, 2005 human-like H1N1 viruses in pigs, and 2006 H2N3 viruses in pigs that were a mixture of avian H2, avian N3, and then that triple reassortment core in the middle. So things are constantly changing in swine influenza virus, such that any time you go to any pig farm in North America today, you may encounter any one of these types of viruses. Um, they're all genetically and antigenically distinct. There's some cross-reaction between the H1s, um, but, not, but not a lot. And so we have variations in our H1s, we have reassortant H1s, we have human-like H1s, we have our swine-like H1s, we have our classic-like H1s, and then in our H3s there seems to be a dominant um, cluster 4, cluster 3 variant 
type of age you're in too. So anytime you walk into a pig farm, these are the influenza viruses that you might encounter. I have to show some phylogenetic trees because it's it's what I do almost every day and, and everybody receives these in their emails and, and sometimes they get questions back and sometimes I don't. Um, but I just wanted to show you kind of the genetic variation here. So um, if we look at classical H1N1 here at the bottom of the tree, we kind of think of that as uh, Neanderthal influenza virus and this is uh, Michael Phelps influenza virus, a, you know, a genetic uh, evolution of the virus, a genetic evolution of humans, the tree. Uh, evolves uh, up to the right here. We've got our classical influenza viruses and they're evolving and changing over time. We have this separate set of swine influenza viruses, sorry, human influenza viruses uh, with our swine influenza viruses mixed in, um, evolving as a separate group. Okay, so that's the, the phylogenetic tree, that's the presumed evolution of these viruses. And I say presumed because I can't pretend to know every single influenza virus that occurred from 1918 to today. That's just not possible. H3 influenza virus here, if, if this is um, the evolutionary ancestor here, we see that progression of influenza viruses evolving um, over time. Um, we have our initial introductions of the, the triple reassortant Texas 98 viruses, um, different human and virus introductions into pigs represented by the italics here and then our spin-off of our swine influenza viruses as those viruses become established in swine um, and, and spread and cause disease in our, in our swine herds. Um, there's some cross-reactions between the H1s, but if we look at cross-HI or how the viruses react with um, hyperimmune antisera um, generated against those viruses, um, there's some reaction, but there's it definitely you can see a distinction between the viruses most times, um, especially three in the newer H3N2s. Um, that are completely different from the older H3N2s. And so this genetic and serological diversity exists in North American swine influenza viruses, and this is problematic um, when the virus variants emerge and that complicates our diagnostic efforts or limits your vaccination and control success. And so what was necessary is to develop diag method, diagnostic methods for the detection of all influenza A viruses. Um, so we were able to tell, yes, you had an influenza A virus infection, no matter if it was H1N1, H3N2, H1N2, or H2N3. And so we've been working over that for the past year. And um, what we've um, enhanced is our real-time RT-PCR methods, um, adopting the USDA protocol for avian influenza virus detection, for swine influenza virus detection through some collaborative work with the USDA. Um, what we've developed and, and what we're using currently um, is a rapid, accurate, and inexpensive method that can be used on both anti-mortem and post-mortem samples. I used to have to get up here and say you have to send me tissues of lungs from pigs in order for me to get a diagnosis if it's influenza virus. Um, and in these tough times, um, every little pig is, is, is worth some money. And so it's nice to have an anti-mortem test available that works on nasal swabs secretion. This particular RT PCR test um, detects the matrix gene, um, which is abundant and conserved among all influenza A viruses. So this test works for avian influenza viruses, equine influenza viruses, canine influenza viruses, and swine influenza viruses of any subtype. And what we did to, to, to evaluate this test was we took 32 virus variants of all different types of influenza viruses that we had on hand and was able to detect all 32 viruses. Um, in the initial evaluation, we tested 222 lungs and 88 nasal swabs um, in our um, initial evaluation. And we found many more positives on our matrix real-time PCR than our previous format nuclear protein PCR. And many more positives, especially on the nasal swabs using the new format with a sensitivity that, that, that's very acceptable. Um, these positive results were confirmed by subtyping virus isolation, histopathology, and or clinical signs or seroconversion in the pigs when we had the follow-up available. So we're very happy to have a, a much better um, diagnostic tool um, to detect influenza virus. And once the virus is detected, it really helps to determine what type of virus you have. So characterization is, is really the next step. And that will help you determine subtype because it is um, significant to understand do I have an H1N1 virus, an H1N2, H3N2, or, or something completely different. Um, further characterization can be done to determine the genetic and, and antigenic variation. And this information is very helpful for control efforts. We can track virus spread between herds. Um, we can evaluate vaccine um, 
um, protocols and, and possibly go for vaccine implementation and improvement knowing that there's changes in the viruses. And so knowing that a genetic and antigenic variation exists and hearing of commercial um, vaccine, uh, apparent vaccination failures or just some um, not very um, expected performance of vaccines and herds and finding H3N2 viruses and other viruses that were varying and, and prevalent throughout the swine. Um, several years ago, um, we, we initiated a study um, to evaluate the um, efficacy of commercial vaccines to protect against these H3N2 variants. We completed that study and published it in July 2007 um, to see if we could um, evaluate vaccine efficacy against these newer strains. We vaccinated the pigs with commercially available vaccines, all the ones that were available at the time, challenged them with a heterologous virus, a completely different virus than that was in the vaccine, and really a completely different virus um, in the H3N2 group. And then we evaluated the pigs after challenge for um, protection from disease, basically clinical signs, gross and microscopic lesions of pneumonia and virus shedding. And that was collaborative work with Ji Hoon Lee and Han Su Ju published um, in July 2007 in CJVR. Um, just briefly, uh, vaccinate, vaccinate, um, and then blood test and challenge, and then observe the pigs daily um, prior to necropsy. So we had um, vaccinated pigs with a homologous virus, vaccinated pigs with heterologous viruses, non-vaccinated challenged pigs, and pigs in a control group. Um, we had actually um, three, three groups of this heterologous virus challenge. Um, just to summarize the results here briefly, is that um, in the homologous vaccinated groups on uh, day uh, one, three, and five, we were not able to detect influenza virus in, that, in nasal swabs, but in the um, non-vaccinated and heterologous vaccinated challenge groups, um, there was nasal swab shedding of virus um, that was detectable. It was reduced um, compared to non-vaccinated controls, but it was still shedding. Um, we were able to see uh, reduced pneumonia in both heterologous vaccinated pigs and homologous vaccinated pigs compared to non-vaccinated control. Um, now that challenge virus, um, as we look at more and more viruses, we look at this challenge virus and see how, how unique it really is. At the time it had um, about 93% nucleotide similarity and uh, 33 amino acid differences, 13 of which were at presumed antigenic sites. And I'll see presumed, and I'll, I'll get to that again later. But the outcome of this study is that vaccinated pigs had reduced clinical signs and gross pneumonia when compared to non-vaccinated control. And I'll mention a caveat here of um, all uh, laboratory studies of influenza viruses. We do not produce the same clinical signs that you see in the field. It's rare to see a pig cough. We do have a very low fever in some uh, nasal discharge, but we don't have the acute respiratory disease seen in the field. So you have to take that into consideration in these studies with a handful of pigs in experimental settings. Um, so vaccination is, is helpful, but certainly um, could be improved the, the closer the uh, virus in the vaccine matches the virus um, in the field. Um, so there, the hope is that there are updated vaccines on the horizon um, stemming from these studies and studies that all the vaccination companies are working very hard at um, getting new products on the market and, and they're coming to keep up with these changes. Um, there is, however, continued reassortment and change and so we can improve our products um, to keep up with the changes in the, vac in the viruses, um, but we have to continue to monitor that change. And so one of the changes that occurred um, happened in 2006, and I, I mentioned it briefly, but it was that isolation of reassortant H2N3 and avian swine reassortant virus from pigs in the United States. And that was a collaborative effort um, across multiple agencies, um, including the National Animal Disease Center, uh, USDA Animal Research Services, um, Iowa State University, St. Jude's Research Hospital, and the University of Minnesota. So none of the work um, really is ever done alone, and I, I want to uh, thank everybody for, for sharing their viruses and experiences and, and work with us. And so that was published in um, Proceeding National Academy of Sciences at the, uh, the end of 2007. But just a little bit about this virus, because um, it has been talked about very much in, 
and probably rightly so. We found it uh, April 2006 and September 2006, outbreaks of respiratory disease in growing pigs. Gross lesions of broca broc pneumonia just looked like influenza viruses. Now these two farms, a column farm A and farm B, are multi-site commercial farms. Um, they're four miles apart, but they do not share pigs, feed, personnel, or, or transportation. Um, it was an influenza virus pneumonia, but the influenza virus we recovered at that time was untypable by our subtyping and uh, gene sequencing and serotyping techniques, even though the pigs had characters lesions. And so full genome sequencing was completed, and that's where it was determined that this virus was an H2N3 avian influenza virus, or swine influenza virus with avian origin, hemoglobin and neuraminidase. Um, and that was concerned by, confirmed by a variety of methods. I want to point out again, you saw this in a small cartoon on one of the first slides, but here's that triple reassortment um, internal gene constellation. And all this virus did was take an H2N3 from from wild waterfowl that it encountered and, and stuck it on the outside. So reassortment with H2 and 3 to make a new virus. Um, it groups off by itself um, with mallards and um, other fowl throughout the United States. And I want to point out that this is a completely separate um, um, cluster of viruses or genetic you know, relationship of viruses than the human pandemic from, 19, from the 650s and 60s. So that was a good thing. Um, and the N3 um, was also of avian of origin. Now, how did this virus get there? And this is important to understand for, for controlling influenza virus in the future. Both of these farms use surface or pond water um, for their pigs, for both watering the pigs and cleaning the barns. And those ponds are frequented by migrating waterfowl. And remember, waterfowl are the natural reservoir for influenza viruses. And they're infected with all 16 H types and all nine N types. So at any time, they're dumping influenza viruses into the water. And if the conditions are right, those uh, influenza viruses can be transferred to humans or to pigs um, or to other animal reservoirs as we, as we study it more closely. Um, is this a continuing problem or a one-time event? Well, first we went out to both farms, A and B, to determine, although I found H2N3 in the laboratory, was there H2N3 on these farms? And sure enough, there were convalescent antibody predators and sows and gills and lean pigs even six to 12 months after the disease was first detected. Um, but as time went on, 15 to 18 months later, later after the disease, only mature or older sows, sows born, or sows existing on the farm during the first isolation of the disease were positive, and young sows, parity ones and parity twos and gilts were all zero negative, even though were, they were co-housed um, in that same farm. So the disease did not seem to be spreading from the old sows to the young sows. No human illnesses were ever reported, and that was a concern for most people because H2 viruses hadn't been reported in the United States or even throughout the world in the human population since the 60s. And so potentially everybody born after the 60s was susceptible to an H2 influenza. Um, but we were fortunate through collaborations with the Centers of Disease Control to visit this farm, one of the two farms again, and um, collect serological surveys of the workers and the veterinarians, and there is no H2 seroconversion in any of those workers or veterinarians. Um, so there were, even though they were exposed to H2 positive pigs, there wasn't any uh, evidence of exposure in these humans. So that was a good thing. So pigs can be an intermediate host for avian, human, and swine influenza viruses, allowing for the emergence of new reassortments, but it doesn't always mean that those pigs are creating viruses that can readily transmit to humans or cause pandemics or even epidemics. So what is the future of uh, swine influenza virus? What does it look like? Well, the vaccination challenge studies have been useful for exploring in vitro observations such as anagenic and genetic differences. So I find genetic differences between two viruses in the laboratory. What does it mean? We're able to inoculate the pigs with one virus challenge um, with another virus to, to see um, if there's a difference in their immune response or in the disease expression. But those, um, those studies are expensive um, and that can be limited and, and, and doesn't really reflect what's going on in the field. I have 30 pigs in the laboratory that never cough, I have a very mild fever, and yet continually you're seeing pigs on farms um, coughing, respiratory distress, and, and even death. Um, from the same viruses and vaccination protocols. So they can be limiting. 
Um, but gene sequencing and, and going forward, even reverse genetics may be more helpful in determining these significant differences, and especially in studying these viruses that have genes that may contribute to immune escape. And so we're doing a lot of different ongoing research for influenza viruses. I first want to talk about our um, influenza virus surveillance that we're doing between swine, humans, and avians, um, because there was a lot of concern, or public health concern, about influenza virus, especially with the emergence of high path avian influenza viruses, H5N1, um, throughout Asia that are capable of going directly from birds to human and causing death in humans. And so what we've been doing at the University of Minnesota in collaboration with the uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, National Infectious and Allergy Disease Research Center with a multi-lab and college uh, collaboration with the School of Public Health and others, we're looking at um, novel swine influenza viruses, especially in areas where interspecies transmission is likely to occur due to high densities of both avian and swine production or poultry and swine production. And when we're talking about Minnesota and in our other location, North Carolina, we're talking about turkey and swine production. And so, um, and we're also looking at uh, influenza virus transmission between swine and swine operation and employees. And, and these next few slides I'm gonna share with you are, are the work of Amanda Bedoin, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota Veterinary Population Medicine Department um, who's doing some international population medicine studies, and Jeff Bender, um, and, a, and a host of other people um, at the University of Minnesota. And the hypothesis and the objectives for these studies is that transmission of swine influenza virus likely does occur between pigs and swine facility workers. In some publications in 2003 by Dr. Chris Olson and in 2006 by Dr. Greg Gray at the University of Iowa, show that swine workers and swine veterinarians such as ourselves are more likely to have antibodies to swine influenza virus uh, than the baker or the banker or um, the accountant down the street. And so we wanted to better understand the occurrence and impact of these swine influenza virus infections on the swine production in facilities themselves. And then if we um, were to happen on the situation, we would detect and characterize influenza viruses from workers and pigs on the same site where both were sick with influenza-like illnesses. And so what we've been doing um, since October 2007 is every time we have an influenza detection event in Minnesota pigs, um, we have a Amanda, the Dr. Bodoin conducts a survey with you veterinarians, and I want to thank all of you that have responded, and I know they get tedious questions, but I think we've got some interesting information that's going to help us go forward, and at least to answer these questions are, are swine workers and swine veterinarians at greater risk for zoonotic influenza. And so we had 205 detection events just in Minnesota pigs um, in this time period between October and May. And we were able to complete, of those 205 detection events, we contacted 77 veterinarians, 77 surveys completed by 37 veterinarians. Um, so influenza virus is a common occurrence for some veterinarians, and they were, they were called frequently, um, and some were called infrequently. But I, I think these um, responses are interesting. Um, the farm types um, affected with influenza virus, just as we'd suspect, um, both finishers and lean to finishers, um, the growing pigs uh, mostly, um, the majority of the cases of influenza virus at those times. Um, the ages of pigs affected, 99%, well these numbers are, don't add up sometimes, but the majority of the pigs um, affected were the growing pigs and, and less outbreaks in the adult farms. Um, just a range of farms, but the, the age, average age of the pig affected by influenza virus is 11 weeks, um, with the morbidity ranging from 2 to 100%, um, but consistently a low mortality. Um, so this is pretty typical, and, 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 and either you all are guessing or just reading the books back to us, um, or this is actually the case for influenza virus here. Um, the affected groups of pigs, um, a, a lot of the growing pigs, 90% of the growing pigs in these surveys were not vaccinated against influenza virus. Sometimes we didn't know the influenza virus um, infection status. Um, and um, variable whether the sows of the affected pigs were, were vaccinated. We got into um, personal protective equipment used by the workers um, on the farm to see um, is there a reason why swine influenza virus is or isn't going in between uh, pigs and people. Um, it's very common 
to wear, uh, always wear footwear and always wear protective clothing. That's our shower in and shower out. But if we're trying to present, prevent um, infection from respiratory secretions, um, very few people um, wear gloves and even fewer wear uh, a mask or any kind of respirator type mask on their face. And that would be the number one way to decrease transmission. In the flu season for humans, they always talk about washing your hands, um, covering your face when you sneeze. Um, here we can prevent um, infections on our hands and, and coughing and sneezing into the pigs by just employing these gloves and masks. Um, difficult to wear masks, not so difficult to wear gloves. Um, so that's something we'd like to see improve. Um, there were some cases where the workers were reported ill with respiratory symptoms during illness at the same time as the pigs. Uh, we weren't always successful in following up with those. Some people flat out said no, they didn't want to have their workers um, investigated, and, and a few people said yes. And so we were able to visit some farms and, and um, at least collect blood. Um, and going forward, we'll be able to go to the farms and, and collect respiratory uh, samples from the workers as well to see to see who has what, basically. Um, so moving forward on that particular product, we're going to continue those veterinary surveys, and I thank all the producers and the veterinarians in Minnesota for, for answering those surveys when they're called. But we'd like to perform uh, producer validation surveys to see if your clients are saying the same things as you are, because um, a lot of the times we're talking right to the veterinarian. Um, and we would like to work closely with, with um, a swine production group or over the course of the next year, um, actively taking swine human and environmental samples. Instead of this retrospective studies, can we partner with um, some farms in Minnesota to be to be on site or to be in closer contact to, to follow up these samples as, as soon as these illnesses occur? And that's what we're moving forward with on that particular study. Um, getting back to the turkeys and the swine, and, and this is, um, you might hear more about this going forward. Uh, the, the, the turkey growers have, have heard some of this, um, but uh, we wanted to study regional transmission of influenza viruses between, between swine and turkeys um, in Minnesota. And so this was a work, work uh, com completed under the uh, NIH project that I mentioned before with Dr. Peter Davies and uh, uh, a student, Camila Colli, from uh, Brazil. Um, but basically, um, we wanted to identify and map positive turkey flocks and test nearby swine for influenza viruses. So avian influenza virus is a reportable disease in the United States, and any time a turkey flock is serologically positive, even without evidence of clinical disease of influenza virus, that turkey flock is identified, and those, those turkeys have to go um, to slaughter only or to processing only. Um, so it's a big deal for the turkeys because they have to say, want to have avian influenza virus, and then they have to jump through a lot of diagnostic efforts to say it's, it's not high path influenza virus, uh, let me process my turkeys in a normal way, let's open the borders, uh, let's start moving turkeys around again. Um, and so this is just a map of some counties in Minnesota. Those of you who can recognize counties know where it is, most people don't. Um, but in the orange circles are the H3N2 positive turkey flocks. And the viruses we recovered from these flocks were 99 to 100% similar in the genes, at least HA and um, NA, to swine influenza viruses um, from the same regions. Um, in the pink triangles are uh, swine farms near those turkey flocks. And so you can see that some of the swine farms are within one and two miles, and certainly within three miles of those um, infected turkey flocks. The, uh, the gray to blue coloring in the background is areas of increasing farm density. Now these farm surveys are compiled from um, our uh, state government statistics. They're not completely accurate, but for certain counties they've been, they've been evaluated for accuracy, and so we feel fairly confident in these numbers. So while this turkey flock and this turkey flock is in an area of relatively low farm density, unfortunately they have uh, pigs within a mile of both of them or three miles from them. And, and this farm area is uh, heavily uh, partnered with other pigs in the area. And so Camilla's work showed that um, a flock was more likely to be infected if it had swine farms within one mile. And so a flock was 60% was more likely to be infected if it had one swine farm within one mile 
compared to a 10% infection rate of uh, three farms within three miles. So the closer the turkeys were to pigs, the more likely they would become seropositive with influenza virus. And we did this by not only looking at positive influenza virus events in turkeys, but negative events as well. So that's how we were able to get the risk determination there. Um, so influenza status of the turkey flocks, they want to be influenza negative. Um, they're influenza positive um, when the number of, when, uh, that's associated with the number of swine operations within three miles, and that was a significant um, There's a relationship there. There's a parent dose response as well at all levels. So one farm within one mile um, is not as bad as two farms within one mile, it's not as bad as three farms within one mile. One mile. And this is biologically plausible as well um, from some reports that we've been able to follow up of um, growing swine moving into one barn and um, having influenza virus and the nearby turkeys syrup converting to influenza virus about four to six months after those swine do. Um, so there's concerns, of course, about our farm location database. Um, we're working on its completeness uh, and bringing it up to date. Um, and the accuracy of those point locations, but we, we feel fairly confident that there is an association between influenza status of a turkey farm and its proximity uh, to swine operations. Um, moving on with the challenge posed uh, by you all for thank you for telling us all about the virus and what it looks like, but help us get rid of it. Um, very fortunate through another collaborative uh, research response um, um, with St. Jude and some researchers on the West Coast to look at the immune response of swine to influenza virus. Um, because controlling swine influenza virus in pigs using killed vaccines assumes that the critical antigenic sites are the same as antigenic sites that are reported for human influenza viruses. Um, if that were the case, we'd be able to control influenza virus in pigs a lot better just by updating our vaccines to the current strains, uh, employing autogenous vaccines every time, um, and, and putting that in, and, uh, and, and uh, vaccinating with the most homologous strain that we can. And when we get a change in the virus, um, we switch it out, um, but yet we still have to change it again the next year. So are we making the changes in our viruses that are in our vaccine based on the correct antigenic information. So we propose to map the antigenic sites of the H3 swine influenza virus. Um, and this is an expansion project um, from the Minnesota Excellence Center for Excellence in Influenza Research and Surveillance, um, which is an ongoing research uh, at, here at the university. And so our first objective for this uh, future study is to generate swine-specific anti-human gluten and influenza monoclonal antibodies to a current antigenic drift variant of H2N2 SIV. Um, we're choosing to use a, a Manitoba virus from 2005 uh, because it's antigenically and genetically similar um, to the virus um, that um, was reported in emerging infectious diseases in December 2007. Um, that was a, a likely case of transmission between between pigs and humans in a community um, in Canada, not in Manitoba, but um, in Alberta. And so we have these uh, drift variant H3N2 influenza viruses that cause a lot of problems in our pigs and occasionally some reports uh, that they go into humans. And so um, to get uh, funding to understand this, um, we have to, to make those links sometimes. But I think this research will really benefit um, the swine industry as well. So once we create those monoclonal antibodies with the H3N2, current H3N2 drift variant, we are going to map the swine H3 molecule with respect to the location and structure of those antigenic sites and compare those to those published in 1981, um, quite a long time ago, for the human H3 human gluten. And from that, um, we'll be able to uh, determine if the mutations of the virus if there's mutations that are occurring at a specific site that make it possible to escape vaccine immunity, we hope to be able to predict cross-protection between vaccine strains and field strains by detecting changes in the identified key antigenic sites and then possibly identify new targets for SIV vaccine design. So we'll be able to, um, because our vaccination and challenges studies are limited in our small groups of live pigs in experimental settings, is there more we can do to tease out the genome to target those studies um, once we know the key antigenic sites or, or find them? So that's a, 
an ongoing project that's just getting underway that, that'll take a, a, a bit of time to complete, but hopefully you'll be patient and we can get through it and learn a lot. Um, so what does the future hold? Uh, um, we don't have influenza virus solved, and, and it's been a, a virus that's been around since 500 BC or so. Um, so it's a very successful virus, and that's because it changes all the time to um, evade the host immune system, and it will continue to change. Um, pigs are exposed to influenza viruses from humans and birds, and that leads to reassortment and a subsequent accelerated drift. But I'd like to to take this opportunity at this podium to say that influenza viruses of pandemic potential, those that are going to threaten to wipe out the human race, those do not require a passage through pigs. And if you look at recent publications in um, Nature and virology magazines, um, humans, airways have the same receptors as pigs. They can combine, they can receive influenza viruses from birds and humans and pigs as well and reassort them as do quail. Um, and so there isn't a necessary passage through pigs to create a pandemic human influenza virus. It's not necessary. Pigs are indeed are exposed to multiple viruses, but they do not um, create viruses of pandemic potential for every reassortment that occurs. But it is important to continue to sur do soil influenza virus surveillance. Um, and it is achievable, and through our diagnostic efforts and our multi-lab collaborations, it's, it's very practical. And so our future surveillance efforts um, should take place in tandem with even in human influenza virus surveillance, and that's where we're, we're, we're moving. Um, there's a, a database uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health called the BioHealth Base, and there's some people much smarter than me that can um, can look at these viruses, but yet we'll be able to give them our practical pig experience and, and try to relate their computer findings to what's really going on in the world. We especially want to look at these areas where interspecies transmission is likely to occur, um, as in situations where there's high densities of both uh, avian and swine. Um, the data from our increased and improved surveillance um, can be applied to timely disease control. So we're hopefully not going to just tell you about the virus, but how to control it. Um, working with um, human collaborators, we can start to look at antiviral technology um, and better vaccines, uh, modified live vaccines or vectored vaccines. Um, some of the great work done by E.B. Vincent and her group at the American Animal Research Services at the USDA looks at those novel vaccine technologies. We can look at biosecurity enhancements. There is regional transmission of influenza viruses. You can um, be fairly confident that there isn't a lot of um, traffic um, and people sharing between a lot of these turkey and swine sites in Minnesota. Um, and so what can we do biosecurity-wise? Um, if the virus is, if the filter's possible, um, can we just insist on gloves and, and respirators at most times to decrease transmission? And then we'd be hopefully be able to do detailed risk assessments. We saw in our surveys, growing pigs are, are, are experiencing the most amount of influenza viruses out there, self-limiting infections, so we don't want to spend a lot of control on the disease in the growing pig, but that's where the number of viruses are, are, are coming out. And so can we look at those risk assessments um, in our populations and try to control influenza virus that way? Um, that concludes my talk, and I do have some time for questions, but before I uh, take questions, I'd like to acknowledge um, everybody at the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory where, where I work, um, and the entire staff and faculty there I'm one person in a, in, a, in a big lab that works very, very well together. Um, I never feel alone there, um, and I have um, people that will help me with, with every step of every project, and willingly and with interest, um, which is a great thing. Um, specifically, thank my, uh, my mentors throughout my career. My uh, graduate faculty is listed first, um, and my uh, colleagues. Um, at the diagnostic lab um, and in the university and um, collaborators such as Richard Revy at St. Jude. Um, I list them as funding agencies, but really they're, they're partners and, and friends as well, specifically um, PIC, uh, my first employer um, ever in pigs. I didn't know what a guilt or a barrel was um, until I went to PIC as a veterinary student. And uh, my roommate, 
uh, veterinarian who worked locally was explaining to me, here's the ilium, here's the jejunum, here's the duodenum, and my, my roommate who had taught me what a gilt was and what a barrel was and things like that, and he says, it's all guts to me, doc. And so I learned a little bit of both from the veterinarian and my production uh, roommate. Um, and, and the numerous collaborators um, um, throughout uh, the world just really fortunate to work uh, with these people. Um, and I'm the pig vet in this group, and, I, and I'm proud to be a pig vet working with these uh, uh, people in their various fields. Um, so with that, I, I thank you for your time and attention and for your coming early today. I hope you learned something, um, and I would take any questions that you have. Thank you.